Hello, my name is Greg Crinklaw and I'm the developer of Sky Tools. Uh, this is our updated video for entering an imaging system as some things have changed. So uh, the first thing you need to do when you start Sky Tools is to create your imaging systems. We go up to setup up here, we click, click imaging systems. That brings up the dialog. There will be some shipped with the software. Um, so there'll be some already here, or at least one. Um, there's no new button. So the way this works is we select a telescope or an imaging system that's closest to what we're already, or what we're planning to put in, um, or just one at random, and click the clone button. Now we've cloned that telescope. I'm going to give it a new name, and I'm going to call it the Redonda Observatory. TPO. Okay, so the first thing we need to, to, to tell it about is how this telescope is mainly used and the choices here are private system, shared by night, or shared by time slot. This is a private telescope so you have access to it all night long. So I'm going to set it to that. If it was an eye telescope it might be um, shared by time slot. The next thing to do is put in the actual telescope or optical tube assembly and I'm going to um, click the little gear icon here and that brings up this dialog if I had just selected one here and we had the telescope already entered um, I would just select it from the list but this is a new telescope so I'm going to click the gear icon and click new and normally you can go through here this long list of telescopes and find your telescope and click on it but there aren't any TPOs in here just yet so I'm going to select enter manually which isn't a, a problem telescopes are very easily entered so this is going to um, allow me to enter the information for my telescope it is a TPO 12 inch um, it is an RC so I select that the um, change this to millimeters and I'm going to put in that it is uh, has an aperture of 305 millimeters and 2440 is the focal length which brings us to f8 but on this telescope we have put in a focal reducer so that actually brings it down to f6. I'm going to put an f6 here, which brings the focal length down to 1830. And since we have a focal reducer that's permanently in there, I'm going to check this box to say there's a built-in focal changer. And what that does is tell Sky Tools that there's another piece of glass in the optical system. So the next thing to do is the orientation. This should usually be unmodified for, for an imaging system. Optics, this part here isn't generally used for imaging systems, so you can ignore that. When we chose an RC, it estimated the central obstruction at 39%, but uh, I looked up this telescope and it is actually a whopping 48%. So we put in the central obstruction. Um, we don't really need any information for finding devices and so forth. I'm just going to click Done. And now we have set up the TPO 12 inch for this. Next thing to do is to enter the camera. So here's the current camera that was imported with the clone system. Down here at the bottom, you have a choice between your cameras and get camera from pool. Your cameras are cameras that you may have saved. And I have a lot of them because of testing. Um, this allows you to import a camera and customize it. Um, for instance, the gain settings might be a little different even for the same model camera from one telescope to another. If you have access to more um, than one, you might want to customize two different cameras. Um, so this, for most people, is going to be blank because you haven't set up any cameras yet. The other choice is to get the camera from Pool. This is a list of cameras that are actually shipped with Sky Tools. It's a CCD camera. and we go down looking for the camera we're looking for, which is a um, 6030E. And I'm going to click Use This Camera. So 
now the information has been imported for that camera I'm going to go over the the basics here it's a it's a standard astronomical CCD camera so with that selected here's the name make and model this value here is the full well in electrons so once you reach this many electrons that have uh, been in a, that have been captured by a pixel it's going to saturate so this tells you the saturation limit sky tools will use that to warn you about saturation you can put in a percentage here for the linear value if you do photometry in particular there's going to be some point at which very bright sources are no longer linear so you could put in a percentage here of the full well say 75 percent we're just going to leave that blank in this case um, there's no anti-blooming gate on this camera if there was we would check that and put in a value here like say a thousand and that's all in the specs of the camera we don't have that on this camera pixel size microns number of pixels read noise I'm gonna put in very small dark signal here the bit depth that's important to fill in um, this camera it's 16-bit uh, which is the most common next thing we're going to do is add gain settings because many cameras uh, some cameras these days have variable gain se selections so this is where you'd put in the the different gain selections uh, most cameras have one or two gain settings so what you would do is you'd click add here and you would put in a gain of say 1.5 and an offset say a 100 this is the value that is added to your your um, final result your final number number and ADU arbitrarily so that during calibration it doesn't go negative sometimes this is this is added in the calibration process and this is zero if that's the case put in zero if it's added by your camera put in the value here the typical value is a hundred so I'm gonna go go ahead and say that this is for any binning now the reason that this is here this selection is some cameras use a different gain setting for a different binning so for instance there'd be one gain setting for one times binning and then another gain setting for two three four whatever in which case I would select greater than one or if there's a different binning for each of these I would put in a different one for each of these so I would go ahead and click add and put in another gain for a different binning if you have um, a camera with variable gain settings say uh, one of these cameras then you put in the value the the value that that uses and actually it would be zero for the for the gain setting that uh, is internally used by by those cameras and then you would put in the offset etc and this will allow you within the software if you look up in the right corner here um, it says gain 1.5 to select the different gain settings we're going to uh, delete the ones we've added and just go back to what we had to begin with and if it is a selectable gain setting you check this box here so the next thing is the quantum efficient of the quantum efficiency of the detector versus wavelength and this is the absolute quantum efficiency sometimes you will see a graph of the quantum efficiency and it is the relative quantum efficiency um, and I don't want to go into too much detail here but you have to make sure these are the absolute quantum efficiencies this data is is available for all standard astronomical CCD cameras you can usually find a graph um, the last thing down here is if there is an a built-in guider chip on this camera then you would click enable here and put in the offset from the center in millimeters the pixel size and the number of pixels now we're going to come back to guiding in a little bit this is where you set up your guider chip if it's part of your camera 
and you're not going to need to set it up later on otherwise. But if you use an external guider, you're going to set it up separately. This chip doesn't have one, so I'm going to click Enable or Uncheck Enable. Our camera is all set up, so I'm going to click Done. We're going to enter the mount next, and this was on, is on a gem. So uh, these values here sort of define the imaging system. And if you if you put a different camera on your telescope or change the optical tube assembly or change the mount, it's a whole different imaging system. And you really need to create a separate imaging system for those cases. Okay, so if you have more than one camera that you swap in and out, create a separate imaging system for that camera. So the next thing is the optical configuration. Here are your choices. Now there can be a little bit of confusion between what we're calling primary focus and pr prime focus. Primary focus is the place where a camera is normally placed for your optical system. So for a refractor, it's going to be at the back end of the telescope. For a Cassegrain, it's going to be at the back end of the telescope. For a Newton, Newtonian, it's going to be at the Newtonian focus of the telescope. That's what we're calling primary focus. That's the normal place where you put a camera. Not to be confused with prime focus, which is where your primary mirror or lens focuses without a secondary um, mirror or lens. And that's here because sometimes people put devices right at that point. Let's say you removed your, prime, your secondary mirror and inserted a hyperstar, then you would select prime focus. I'm going to go back to primary here. If you have focal reducers or focal extenders that you swap in and out, this is where you add them here. So you would click Add, and you would put in, say, uh, two times and a two-inch barrel. Click OK. Now it appears in the list. These will be selectable within the software. Let's say it's a focal reducer, so it's point five times. And now both of these are here. You'll be able to select these um, up here where it says primary focus and in other places throughout the software. But in our case, we don't have any, so I'm just going to go ahead and delete them. Next is the mirror efficiency. And for reflecting telescopes, we've discovered in our testing that the last time the mirror was clean makes a very big difference to the amount of signal received. And so what we're going to do here for the mirror efficiency is put in the last time the mirror was clean. This is a fairly new telescope, so I'm going to put in December 1st, 2017. Press enter. And the secondary mirror was, was clean at about the same time, so I'm just going to click Same. And then I'm going to click on the Advanced button. Now, here's where we put in efficiency values for various filters in the telescope or in the imaging system. But, um, and I'm going to release uh, a utility program that will look at a Landalt star field that you've taken an image of or multiple images of in different filters, and it will give you numbers to put in here. It gives you a final tweak to make your results um, of, of SkyTools very, very accurate. But for now, we're just going to leave all these as one and all these set at none. The next thing is the filter degradation coefficient. And we're just going to leave that at 6,000. This tells you how, um, how the mirror degrades over time between cleanings. Next, we have the best full width of half max of a star in arc seconds. It, over time, you're going to discover that even on the very best night, high in the sky, you never seem to get a star um, with a full width of half max smaller than this value. So where I'm going to put in for this telescope is about one and a half arc second. So even if the scene got better than this, it bottoms out at 1.5 arc seconds. And that's an important thing to put in here because it tells Sky Tools that that's as good as it gets for this imaging system. Um, optically, this is the best it can do. And it uses that when it does its calculations. I'm going to click OK. Down here at the bottom, this is where you select the location of your telescope. 
We're going to put in the Mesa Redonda Observatory that we entered earlier. Um, if this if this telescope is moved around, this is going to be the default location of the telescope. So Sky Tools is going to use this unless you tell it it's going to be moved someplace else. If it is in uh, a dome, if it's fixed, it's always used at the same place, then we're going to check fixed here and Sky Tools won't even let you select the location. It will just always use this location for the telescope. We talked a little bit about guiders. The guider attached to um, your CCD and if you have one of those you don't need to configure this. If you have an external guider or an external guide scope you need to select you, know, you need to select that here. We're going to put in an off-axis guider and these values may be a little hard to determine. Um, you can measure them on your off-axis guider from the center to the pick center of the pick mirror and put that value in here. Maybe it's uh, 20 millimeters or you can measure it in the sky um, and discover that maybe it's 20 arc minutes. So that is the separation between the center of the main scope field of view and the center of the guide scope field of view. This is always a positive number because we're also going to enter a position angle relative to the main camera. So if this thing is set up so it's due north of the main camera, then we would just leave this at zero degrees. If it's due south of the main camera, then this might be 180 degrees. Okay, so this, this is going to be used to set up your field of view indicators so that you can easily find guide stars. If the, the, the guide camera itself has a little bit of rotation, this is something you don't usually need to worry about, but if it is rotated with, with respect to the main camera, then you need to put in that uh, position angle here. Normally you would leave it blank. This is very important. This is the magnitude range of acceptable guide stars. So if uh, in your guide scope, your guide camera, it saturates for stars brighter than seventh magnitude, then put seventh magnitude for the brightest. And if it can't really guide on stars fainter than 13th magnitude, then put 13th magnitude here. And then when you're using the software, it will tell you which stars nearby fit within this magnitude range so that you can use them as guide stars. Down here we put in the uh, width and height in pixels of our guide camera and the pixel size in microns and we're done. Uh, we're not using eyepiece projection so we're not going to select any eyepieces here. The next thing is the camera configuration. First thing about that is if you don't have a rotator and it's at a fixed angle, this is where you put in the angle, the position angle, and um, you select fixed. If you do have a rotator, then this, is, this number is going to change as you rotate. You uncheck the fixed box. And uh, you can leave this at any value you want at that point. This is the maximum binning used in your camera. Um, it just tells Sky Tools not to auto select binning greater than this value. So if you don't use binning at all ever, um, for whatever reason, set this to one. I'm going to set it to two by two binning, which will tell the software to go ahead and choose one of these one by one or two by two, um, whichever is best for the current situation. Next, we're going to enter filters for our camera. That brings up the filter dialog. Similar to the cameras, we have a selection of our filters and a selection of filters from the pool. And I ne neglected to mention earlier when we talked about cameras, the, these filter pool cameras, there's going to be a third selection soon, which will allow you to download them from our website, and you'll be able to um, share cameras and filters to our website, which I am hoping will um, allow us to better keep up with new cameras and different filters so that other users can go through the process of creating a filter or a camera and then sharing it so that everybody doesn't have to keep entering the same data. So these are the, the filters that are assigned to this imaging system. They were there when we cloned it. I'm just going to delete them. 
all deleted. This one has um, Generation 1, Astrodon, uh, Blue. I'm going to double click. Green. I could also click on Assign This Filter. Luminance and Red Filters. It also has a 5 nanometer H alpha filter and a 3 nanometer um, O3. So now we've got the list of filters here. Oh, it also has a uh, V um, photometric filter, so I'll add that. I'm going to click on one of these and select uh, View Edit. And this is to show you what how SkyTools actually uses the filters. It has a, um, a list of transparency values versus wavelength. So this uses a, an actual curve for the filter. And out here at 400 nanometers, there's nothing. And then suddenly it, trans it uh, transmits more and more um, light all the way up to almost a transmission of one and then drops off again. Now, <coughs> excuse me. There, this isn't has not been set up yet. Um, I'm still working on it. But there's a digitizer which allows you to take, uh, say, a JPEG from from your camera or your filter specifications and digitize it so that you can get this curve. Or you could read pairs of data for the filter um, from a file. Right now, neither of those are working, so if you need a filter that uh, I haven't included already, contact me and I'll make it for you. Um, the other thing here to notice is that there's three types of labels. There's the full label, the abbreviated label, which you'll see used in Sky Tools. And here, if you're using ACP, it's going to generate plans for ACP, and this filter label here has to match what you have entered in the ACP. If you're not using ACP, it doesn't matter. I'm going to click OK. That's our list of filters for this camera. The order doesn't matter. Click OK. We don't have any lenses for this imaging system, so that doesn't matter. The next thing is exposure times. These are allowable sub-exposure times. So there's two ways to set this up. Um, you can put in a range. This tells us that uh, you can't use exposure times less than a minute or more than five minutes. Uh, maybe your your mount isn't that good and exposure longer than five minutes are going to trail. Um, maybe you have other reasons not to go shorter than one minute. I can change that to seconds and make that shorter than 10 seconds. So you can't go shorter than 10 seconds or longer than five minutes. Put in whatever works for your, your imaging system there. The other way to do it is create a list of allowed exposure times. I'm going to go ahead and delete these that are already here. And the idea here is if you do calibrations for specific exposure times, then you're going to want to use those exposure times only when you're observing. So I can uh, put in, let's say I do a calibration for 60 seconds and add that. Um, two minutes, add that. 3 minutes or 180 seconds and 300 seconds which is 5 minutes then sky tools when it suggests an exposure time it will only use one of these values here okay so you have two ways you can set that up to help sky tools uh, limit your exposure times based on your experience with your camera I'm going to leave it up here for uh, 30 seconds to 10 minutes and click OK. We're getting close to the end here. Down at the bottom is the control system type. This is an important thing. This is where you tell Sky Tools, especially at the top here, how um, the telescope is controlled. And if you use a hand controller or manual control, you select that. If you use external computer control, you select that. If you use the real-time control um, in within Sky Tools, which is what most of you in the upcoming beta test are going to be doing, you select real-time control. So that's what you're going to want to select. If you use straight-up ACP, you select that. 
and in that case you're going to be um, generating ACP plans uploading them to ACP and executing them if you use eye telescopes you select this it works the same way except eye telescopes have some ACP um, extensions for their plans um, and lastly if you use ACP scheduler um, you select ACP expert so we're going to we're going to use real-time control from within Sky Tools, so I'm going to select that here. We do have an auto guider, and we do have focus max. So we have a we have an autofocus, and we have a rotator for this camera. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Last thing to set up are the timings. Now, this is probably going to evolve over time. It's really just a long list of of how long it takes to do various aspects. Um, of your observing. Some of them only depend on whether or not you have an autofocuser or not. For instance, how, this is how long it takes to do a typical autofocus. Others are going to depend on the type of control system you have. So this is going to get longer. Um, it's important to put in the things that are most appropriate for your system. This, these values here aren't the specifications for the slew rates they from the manufacturer they're a value that you get from actual experience because what it's basically the mean time it takes to slew from one place to another short slews won't generally go as fast they won't get to the high gear longer slews will start slow get faster and faster go to the high gear and then slow down again so this is very difficult to model but I've found that the mean time between slews from one object to another um, works pretty well here. And um, I will be coming out with a utility program that helps you determine those values, assuming you use ACP um, that has logs that it can analyze. So the autofocus time, this is how long it takes to read out the camera between exposures, that's an important value. How long does it take to find the field and update the pointing? If you're doing this yourself, it might take five minutes. So you put in 300 seconds there. Um, dithering, guider settle time, all that stuff will help Sky Tools create a schedule for you that it will be able to follow and it won't get off in time over time. <coughs> Excuse me. So there we have it. Now we've set up our imaging system and we go ahead and click done. And we can go ahead and choose our imaging system here. And you see that it's auto selected the fixed observing location. We didn't put in different focal changers. So primary focus is really the only selection here except for auto. But since there aren't, aren't a lot of different focal changers, it doesn't really matter. Um, you can put this in either one. It's always going to end up with primary focus. Here are the filters we entered, or auto. The binning was allowed to go up to bin 2, or auto. And this is right here is probably going to disappear eventually, but this is where you would select the gain. There's no point in selecting the gain on the planner here because it doesn't affect the signal to noise ratio and that's what's used for all of the planning here but you will see a gain selection appear at different parts of the software okay so that is how you set up your imaging system um, and uh, thanks for watching